Before the Rings of Power, there were the Silmarils. Before Sauron, there was his master Morgoth. Before Aragorn and Arwen, there was Beren and Luthien. Join us as we explore Tolkien and all the ages of Middle-earth with your hosts from TheOneRing.com, Jonathan Watson, Michael Grumbine, and Dan Coates. That means, guys, the cheering from a huge crowd from their live studio audience means we're done with the Silmarillion. Can, I mean, can you believe it? Wow. Like the entire age of Tolkien's Middle Earth is gone behind us forever. <laughs> and this is our recap show. That's right. This is where we say all the things that we missed. No, we don't, we're not going to say all the things we missed. That would take no, too geez. long. We're instead what just are you talking about? Wait, wait, wait. We didn't miss anything. Are you serious? Right. We're going to we give us our... a thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so we're going to recap this week. We're going to go through... We're each going to have our own big thought. We're not just jumping into Dan's head this time. We're jumping into each of our heads. Um, and then we're also going to recap some of the other things. We, we might have missed a little bit, some of the other things that struck us. Um, and then, as is our want, we are going to go into the extended podcast with all of our members who join us in our Discord chat, which you can get to by going to thewondering.com slash member. It's $4 a month, and the first month is free. And there is a discount for this, this amazing hat, which I can't <laughs> fit over my headphones, but there you go, that amazing hat. Make Tolkien great again, because that's what, you're, what we're here for. If I fold it in, I don't know. Anyway. Uh, oh, my kids wore it. That's why it's so small. They're like, you're going to wear that in the podcast? I'm like, I'm not a hat guy. I can't do it. But uh, yeah, I can get that hat. Uh, it's actually probably look below in YouTube, too, if you're watching there. It's now linked in our YouTube channel, so you can see the, our merch just straight below some of it. It took a while to hook it up to Teespring. They're just slow. But uh, yeah, it's there now. So become a member. Join us. You can ask us questions. We will be speaking um, on what we're going to podcast on next, our next discussion uh, is going to be on fairy stories, um, and we're going to have we're going to sprinkle a couple interviews in there too while we're talking about it. But we're going to we're going to look through on fairy stories, and uh, we're going to talk about some thoughts about that. Michael has read it more than us. It's been a long time since I've read it, so I'm coming at it a little bit more fresh than I would have say a decade ago. I don't think Dan's ever read it in whole. You've seen clips and parts, but uh, you've never read it in whole. Uh, and Michael just read it with his kids, so there. Um, he is. So there. Have you guys ever that. seen another podcast or do it? I haven't seen anybody else talk. I about haven't. It. No, no, I don't. I try not to follow a ton of Tolkien podcasts either, but just because it, I don't want their thoughts to intrude on the way that I'm thinking about things. I like the ones that are that, that are informational more than like, um, I don't know, insightful. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's not the best idea, but that's the way that I approach. I don't it. follow the Tolkien podcast because I don't have the free time with the number of children <laughs> I have. So. <laughs> uh, you just put it on, put it in headphones, and ignore your children. That tends to work for me. Oh. You know, mm -hmm. dang it, if I had only known that 24 <laughs> so, years ago. <laughs> so we're going to do that. We're going to also talk about what's coming after that, which we're planning on, and I think everybody will like, which uh, it'll take us a while, uh, but uh, but that will be a lot of fun. And then uh, we also have a couple questions from our members, including about what the heck is the Stone of Eric and how did it get there and what is it made of? And then uh, Artist Richard also submitted a question about what about men and death and non-evil, non-men beings like dwarves? What happens to all those? So we'll talk about that in our extended podcast. Go to thewondering.com slash member and go there. <gasps> Man, I shouldn't fit all that in one breath, but that's what we're doing. And hey, if you're listening to on uh, you know Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, whatever, give us a five-star rating. It'll help people find us. Uh, it'll uh, make the conversation even bigger. And that's, uh, that's what we're looking for because we are here, like we said, for everybody to... Make Tolkien great again. Man, that's just not focusing, but there you go. Um, <laughs> so anyway, all right, guys. We are going to do something this week that we haven't done in quite a while, and that is going to be to play a game of... All that is gold does not glitter. So that Hello. means that um, we are going to... Uh, I am going to quiz Michael and Dan. Thankfully, I'm not, uh, I'm not on the hot seat this week. <laughs> but I'm going to quiz Michael and Dan about how well they know the Silmarillion and the characters and what uh -oh. they said. Now, some of these are harder. Uh -oh. Some of these are easier. Uh, and I think Michael has the, the biggest advantage because he's read it the Don't most. say that. I'm going to get everyone uh, wrong So now. I'm going to give you a negative one to start with, Michael. <laughs> That's my handicap. I was not expecting this pop quiz. <laughs> um, but here we go. So, so we'll just go one by one. We're not, we're not really keeping score. Whoever, gets, whoever, stays, uh, whoever wins this, though, uh, gets to stay on for our Fairy Stories podcast. Whoever loses is kicked out. So anyway. All right. Wow. Okay. No. <laughs> 
joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> but we got to give it some sort of some sort of gravity, some sort yeah, right. of reward. There has to be, some, there there has has to be, be a risk some stakes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway, all that is gold does not glitter. Here we go. First quote. If I put it on the right thing, there we go. Oh, I missed the quote there. Nonetheless, they will have need of wood. <laughs> do you guys remember that? Yes, I do. Nonetheless, they will have need of wood. All right, Dan, I'm going to go to you first every single time. All right. Um, I believe this was Aule talking to his wife. And uh, he was talking about the dwarves, how they're going to need to cut down yes. some trees every once such in a, a while. Such a great quote. And Michael, what do you think? I think it's the same. And I love the fact that uh, afterwards, uh, right, right before it, his wife has come in. She's like triumphant because she's she's just brought about the existence of the um, the the, the ants, ants, yeah, and um, which are spirits from outside of Arda brought into Arda into inhabit trees. Um, so they're actually a kind of perhaps a kind of Maiar. Who knows? Yeah. But uh, but uh, and she's so proud of herself having won these uh, shepherds of the forest and protectors in his. And, you know, her husband's response actually reminds me of the very laconic Spartan responses from from the Peloponnesian Wars and such, where they were they would respond to these long, flowery uh, missives from other kings with like a one line sentence. Um, <laughs> so anyway, Aule being very Spartan in this case. I love that quote. All right. Next one. Let's get there. Next one. None and none, what I have left behind, I count now, no loss. Needless baggage on the road it has proved. Let those that cursed my name curse me still and wind their way back to the cages of the Valar. Let the ships burn. Dan? Uh, I'm going to go with Feanor. Okay. Yeah, Michael? Yes, and the needless baggage was his own people that had supported him and left in leaving Valinor and then attacking the Teleri and going with him. So he, this isn't just him um, rejecting enemies of his. This is him rejecting his own people because that's yeah. the kind of dude like, Fionor was. And Galfin and Galadriel and Turgon and like, yep. all, all the good guys. Leaving them behind. In <sighs> fact, so I love this quote, wait, man. wait, wait, hold on. It's a great yeah. quote. Does that yeah. make him part Harfoot? Because he likes to leave no, people behind. No, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> he was the inspiration for the Harfeet. Feanor, the original Harfoot inspiration, yeah. Feanor. That would be great if they like had this little homage to this one person they didn't know, but who who left pe- people behind on on the paths of ice or something like that. That would be great. <laughs> Feanor was the first person to come up with a song. Nobody goes alone. <laughs> That's Nobody right. <laughs> Nobody walks alone. <laughs> oh yeah, it's so true. Except and he nobody goes yeah. off trail. Everyone Oswald goes off trail, off trail, and we're going to let the ships yeah. burn. That would have been nice, yes. <laughs> it All lost right, next a little quote. bit in the translation. <clears throat> All right. Lady, let us depart while there is time. What hope is there in the wood for you or for me? Here we are held in bondage, and no prophet shall I find here, for I've learned all that my father has to teach, or that the Nalgrim will reveal to me. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Should I, I'll read it one more time for all those listeners. Lady... Let us depart while there is time. What hope is there in this wood for you or for me? Here we are held in bondage, and no prophet shall I find here. For I have learned all that my father has to teach, or that the Nalgrim will reveal to me. I bet Michael knows it. Is no? this... Um, well, here, I'm going to... Should I give so, you a hint? Yeah. What hope is there in this wood for you or for me? All that I, my I father wanna, has to teach. I want to I say it's the, the Dark Elf's son... But I can't remember the guy's name. Is it, okay. it Maglin? Maglin? Okay. M- Michael? That's my I'll guess. Go. Okay. Michael? Uh, my guess is Fingon. Fingon. Dan! Amazing! Whoa. Nice. Good job, Dan. Yeah, Maglin. All right. Well All right. done. I'm, I'll take away that. He's, negative talking to, he's talking to his mom, right? Yeah, yeah. This is when he's, uh, uh, he's, he's convincing her to leave. Um, and, uh, and he's done. He doesn't want to be held captive anymore. Uh, and then they what they get on to Kurufin and he has that uh Kurufin has a great line to to uh Ael who's chasing his his uh what is it? Is it it's uh is it Idril? He's chasing Idril, right? Is it Idril that he's chasing? Idril and is oh, that no. Is, no. What's his what's who's what who is Ael's wife? Who is uh Turgon's daughter? Is it is Arith- Idril? Arithel? Arithel. Oh my god. Arithel. Okay. So anyway, all right, let's go to the next one. I think I have four, so this there might be only one more here. Maybe there's two, I can't remember. Um, all right. Come on. Death you can give me earned or unearned, but the names I will not take from you of baseborn, nor spy, 
nor thrall. Death you can give me earned or unearned, but the names I will not take from you of baseborn, nor spy, nor thrall. I think this is Baron talking to Thingol. Oh, I got I got to fix. There we go. Baron talking to Thingol. Okay. Michael? Yep, I agree. Boom. Hey. Yes. Man, look at this. Good job, Dan. Holy moly. Dan is like on a roll. That one, that one's perfect. not hard. Yeah. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's go to the next one. From the shadow of death, you can no longer save Luthien, for by her love, she is now subject to it. You can turn from your fate and lead her into exile, seeking peace in vain while your life lasts. But if you will not deny your doom, then either Luthien, being forsaken, must assuredly die alone, or she must with you challenge the fate that lies before you, hopeless, yet not certain. That's a long one. I don't know if I can read it. Reread it. What are you thinking, Dan? From the shadow of death, you can no longer save Luthien, for by her love, she is now subject to it. Dot dot dot. This is hopeless a, yet not certain. This is a weird guess, and I'm I'm, I'm struggling to remember the name. Um, is it the Hound, the dog? Uh, okay, that's your guess. The Hound. In, in, in the tale of Baron and Luthien, he talks like a few times. I think that's one of the times he talks. Final answer. That's my final answer. Okay. I hope I hope it's right. Michael, this is my favorite. Um, Vala, this is Mandos. Mm. Oh it's no! That <laughs> was Mandos. <laughs> it Look is at that. Huan. That's yes. awesome. This is it's either Mandos at uh, when Luthien gets there, right? Like uh, yeah. when she's in the halls of Mandos and she's yeah. deciding. It kind of sounds like it, but it is Huan. My nice. Dan. Nice. Dan. Oh my gosh. Rocking. That's Ooh, incredible. I, myself. I gotta give up my Tolkien card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. Uh and that that is it. That is all of them. So Dan, you, you Dan you wins. All, you're four Perfect. for four. That's incredible. It's like a, it's like a street fight. Wow. Dan <laughs> wins. Perfect. I can't believe it. Well Fatality. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's different, but sure. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> different video game, yeah. Oh man. Um all right. So nice Dan. Um, yeah, this, so, so you get, uh, you get the privilege now since, since it's been our tradition for as long as we've had this podcast and that's to jump into your big thought first. So Dan's big thought. Michael and I each get one too this week. I just don't, we just don't have these cool little stingers in the middle. Of the yeah, yeah. That, so let's keep it that way. Uh, <laughs> he's earned it. Um, he, he's earned the big stinger. <laughs> Perfect. So, uh, I, I was really struggling uh, today to come up with a big thought that encapsulates the entire Cimmerillion. It's, it's, uh, it's easier. Like if you have like one chapter where you're like, okay, this is what I liked in this part, but like trying to look back on the whole Cimmerillion is kind of tough. And what I try to do is I just try to think what what's my favorite story or my favorite part of the entire Cimmerillion. And I think I landed on the story of Arendil. Um, just the mm-hmm. fact that he's the one that finally brings about the um, the U catastrophe of the whole first age. So he's he's the one that finally brings the the triumph out of the bleak darkness that's going on. And it, it's completely changed for me. I'll, I'll sit on my porch and smoke my cigar and read my book, and I'll look up and I'll see the evening star uh, on the horizon. The one star that you can see in Southern California. It's the one star you can see. <laughs> so, so, so you can usually see the moon, and then there's Venus, and then there's a little tiny dot right next to it. Uh, that right now is Mars, <laughs> and uh, it just it yeah, makes me think yeah. of Tolkien every time now. And that's something that I think is going to be that's going to stick with me for a mm. long time. That. Mm. That 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 symbol that, that that he was able to take a take the myth and infuse this symbol of hope into something that people see every morning and every evening, and I I really like that he did that. It was really cool. That that makes me. I mean, that's um, you, it's it, it's also one of your favorite lines from the, from the Lord of the Rings, right? What Sam says. Um, um, yeah. Uh, do you remember it offhand? Yeah, your memory is always that, you mean, that, um, Do you mean that? Do you mean what Bronwyn says only... in Rings of Power? No, <laughs> <laughs> that that evil is only a passing thing. That there's there's beauty and truth 
the high, high and above its reach. I'm, I'm butchering it completely. Here we go. Okay, I found... Um, Beauty and goodness. <clears throat> yeah, they're peeping among the cloud rack above a dark tor high up in the mountain. Sam saw a white star twinkle for a while. The beauty of it smote its heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land and hope returned to him for like a shaft, clear and cold. The thought pierced him that in the end the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light and high beauty forever beyond his reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So just that, that just that connection <clears throat> that uh, in the Cimmerillion, um, Arundel, he's the star of, of, of hope, um, Gil Estelle. Yeah. And when, when Sam looks up from Mordor, I think that's what he's seeing. I, it doesn't spell it out specifically, but I, I think that's, there's a clear connection of hope with, with seeing the light from that star. It's, that's interesting. So you're taking like in, even Tolkien said the, the Silmarillion, Silmarillion is a tale of destruction and woe, and yet you're taking hope away from it. And I like mm. that, right? In, in the end, there is hope. Uh, and that's really, I mean, that's how, that's how the first age ends. That's how the, even in a sense, that's how the second age ends with the defeat of Sauron at, uh, a little bit. I mean, there's some dastardliness that goes on with what yeah. Isildur is doing. But, and then there's hope at the end in the defeat of uh, Sauron with the One Ring. Um, and so despite all the disaster and my favorite story of Tour and Turambar, uh, we do have hope. So always has to come hope back to Turin Bar for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all That's right. Great. That's My, beautiful, Dan. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, Michael, do you do you want to go or sh should I go? Let's uh, whichever. Go. All right, I'll I'll go. I'll go this time. Okay. So I, I kind of have two big thoughts. One, I just want to say. No, no, is, you only get one. Okay, then then the first one's a small <laughs> thought, and the second one's the big one. Uh, <laughs> Look at that. Um, the, the deafness with which he maneuvers the podcast so is wonderful. Here's my small thought. I just like, I've, I don't think other than, you know, we were in a Chestertonians group together, reading that together was good. But there's a sense of like, with this, with this, doing this as a podcast, one, you're setting yourself up to be out there in front of people talking about something. So you darn well better know what you're talking about. And I still screwed up a ton of stuff and I couldn't remember things and I messed up who said what sometimes. But man, the, I got so much more out of it in this corporate environment just by one really making sure I knew what I was talking about before we got into it. I had some notes and things like that. But two, hearing your ideas without necessarily like being told like this is the way to approach the Silmarillion or something like that, that other people like listening to a podcast will tell you about or a teacher in school would tell, tell you about like this is how to approach um, you know, uh, the taming of the shrew, and this is how to approach King Lear, and right, and they they go through and they say, they kind of give you the ideas for it, rather what we're taking out of this year. So I, this corporate approach to reading for me has been very rewarding. Just want to say that, and I'm looking nice. forward to doing more in the future, uh, and feeling responsible for coming and bringing something to the table. Whereas when you're just in a big reading group, you don't feel like you have to bring anything. You're just hoping that the extroverts talk all the time. Uh, all right, so that's number one. Number two. Oh, no, sorry, that's point one. The full big thought here is um, in reading the Silmarillion this time and going, and again, I have to do this because we did this while watching the Rings of Power. So it became a thing for us in the middle of reading through the Silmarillion. You're reading Tolkien's formative work of everything he ever did um, and you're seeing how somebody portrayed it. And you're seeing, in my opinion, uh, how it was portrayed incredibly poorly. And one of those ways it was portrayed for me was Galadriel because Galadriel became the commander of the Northern armies. And so that was a microcosm of what people think with what a strong woman is, right? They clamor for strong women, which means that they, they have to be at least as strong as the men or the orcs in this case around them. And they have to carry the big swords uh, and they have to ruffle the most feathers. Um, but I think when reading Tolkien, you realize like they, these people have no clue what a strong woman is because one like to them i to these people like being feminine i think is and tell me if you think i'm wrong here but being feminine is being weak like i think even the women think this who write these shows because because th th that means you can't carry a, a big sword um but i think the strength of the feminine is different but just as powerful and so we see that um in the similar one, right we see Haleth who held her people together uh, back when, you know, they, they were on the marches of Doriath and uh, they were waylaid and all the men were killed and she had to hold her people together and even, you know, spoke to and, and denied Thingol. I can't remember exactly what the conversation was, but where Thingol offered her, uh, what, what did he offer her? I'm trying to remember, but she refused Thingol even, right? She was so confident that she refused what, what Thingol's offer was. Um, we saw Varda, 
Varda and Yavana, right? Varda placed the stars in the sky. She held the, the, the Silmarils, the thing that the whole story is about. Uh, Yavana sings the trees into existence, essentially. She, uh, she brings them after, after Morgoth has felled the two lights from uh, the dews of those, or from the, the lights of those, she creates the, the two trees. Uh, Melian creates the whole girdle that uh, defends. Yeah, she, yeah she, she protects her whole people for yeah. centuries. Yeah, and people say, oh, yeah, but she's Meyer. Yeah, but, I mean, she's still, like, this is, there is feminine strength in what she's doing. And then Luthien saves Baron, and she is still the only living thing that by herself essentially defeated Morgoth. Yep. Uh, and uh, and then, then there's, to go to what happened in the Rings of Power, there's Galadriel. Which the real Tolkien, Galadriel. The real Galadriel, which Tolkien was essentially, by the end of his, the telling of the story, and in, in, by the end of his life, he was the wisest and most powerful elf alive. Yep. Um, powerful wise, maybe only second to Feanor, maybe we, we, that's probably debatable in some ways. Um, and she was there, right? She was one of the people that that, that Tolkien mentioned that led her led the people across the Hell Crax. We were just talking about that, and the quote from Feanor where he burned the ships uh, at Losgar, and uh, and she held, she was one of the four that led their people across the grinding ice there. Um, and then uh, and then there's Idril, right? She was the one who for who need, realized like we we got to have a way out just in case. So she had the foresight of saying like let's let's create a back door because. Um, I think that Morgoth is eventually going to defeat us. And so she had the wisdom to move forward. And these, this is all examples of strength. None of these here were carrying a sword. None of these are anything like that. And so you see how Tolkien defined strength and how the re this is where the frustration for me comes in. They redefine these characters into the modern way that they want to read. It has to be for modern audiences. And that means being able to punch a guy. Uh, but here, that's not what it means. All. Oh, and, and of course, lastly, Morgoth was even afraid of Ungoliant. And she was pretty powerful. She, she hmm. was a she. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I took out of it, is like there is so much strength that he shows from the feminine um, that isn't just, you know, fin Fingolfin going up and, and uh, fighting against Morgoth or uh, the leap of Baron or um, world's first WWF <clears throat> move. Yeah, right. Or, or, or Thingol, you know, getting all up in the faces of the dwarves and getting killed. Um, so anyway, that's what I took out of this is like, look at all these, look, look at the characters that have been butchered by modern writers because they just simply don't understand what strength really is. Yeah. Look what they've done to my beautiful boy. <laughs> yeah. One, exactly. one thing I think is interesting to me is that, that Tolkien does write with a sense of, of uh, traditional roles for men and women. Mm -hmm. and, and he does write men to be strong, to be protectors, to be warriors. But he also writes that it's not enough. Like, like for Baron, he's, he's a strong warrior, but he ends up needing to be saved over and over again. Right. Like, yeah. So I think that's interesting that, he, that he's saying that these two need each other. Yep. Luthien saves his life many times. Yeah. 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 But then, uh, but then, I mean, Baron does save Luthien as well. Right? And he does everything essentially right. you know, for love makes you do stupid things. And one of them is vowing that yay with this hand while I hold a Silmaril and, and uh, come back to you. <laughs> yeah. Oopsie. Um, so anyway, so that, that was my big thought, which we can, more. <laughs> still one of my funny, the funniest lines of, I'm not going to read the line exactly, but, but when he comes back, he's like, Hey, I did it. My hand has a Simril, just my hand somewhere else <laughs> in the belly of a wolf right now, <laughs> but I'm holding it. <laughs> yep. I got it. Check. Uh, all right. So Michael, you're, you're, we're onto your big thought now. So my big thought is that the Silmarillion is indeed a very strange book. It's a very strange book. And it is probably a unique book in the world of fantasy and science fiction in the sense that in its type. So I have never read, I've read quite a few fantasy and science fiction novels, hundreds probably over my life. And I have never read one that is only a history of the other ones. I've read ones that were a story with history in them but this is the only one that's history now we had mm -hmm. gone on and on in our podcast about the different kinds of literature that tolkien is delving into as he tells this history the different modes of storytelling that he uses so and that's fair but nevertheless as a whole this is just a history book um and it was not well received this book was so strange it was not well received when it first came out in 1977 
I actually went back and read some of the reviews uh, from that time. And, um, you know, there were, it was not, not kindly received. Um, there were folks from that, I mean, Time Magazine and mm -hmm. New York Review of Books and this, um, uh, the New Statesman and folks that they, they really did not like it. And they didn't like it for some interesting reasons. Uh, they they didn't like it because it didn't have that single sort of storybook motif, the quest line motif. Mm -hmm. They didn't like it because they thought it was a well. One one reviewer called it an empty and pompous bore, um, and <laughs> another reviewer said that Tolkien actually can't write, and he was his his imagination was lacking, um, and so they were really uh, disappointed because of course what they were expecting probably was something like the Lord of the Rings and what they got was a history book. And it's very interesting to see um, how times have changed and how the critics in the last 20 years recognize it as a kind of masterpiece. And they will say things about it like the fact that Tolkien is giving us his true, the nature of his world in a book like you, he's explaining uh, essentially the zeitgeist of Middle Earth through throughout the book. They will talk about how the richness the Tolkien is building this stage upon which his his that makes his other work so compelling. And I think actually that's the closest to the truth. Um, there are some people that think that Tolkien is writing something like Milton, and that he's you know the sympathy for the devil thing where. The, the, and, and they have a point, and the point, their point is the, the most enduring character throughout the Silmarillion, Morgoth. He's the only one that keeps mm -hmm. going through the different stages of the work. He's the only enduring character until he isn't at the very end, but, you know, by end of the Silmarillion proper, he's defeated. But but he's the calm, he's the through line, just like Lucifer's the through line in Milton's Paradise Lost. And so there's a, um, there, the reception has changed. But what everyone agrees, well, the people back in the 70s didn't see this so much, but they but they said it by even by their criticisms, I think, in a way, which is that I think, and this is my big thought, that Tolkien's Silmarillion is the meat to the, the Hobbit milk and the Lord of the Rings bread. Um, the Silmarillion provides some of Tolkien's deepest observations about fallen nature and a fallen world, um, about tragedy, about the nature of good and evil. He gives us the metaphysical heart of which the Lord of the Rings was the epic story and the Hobbit was the children's tale. So, so this is, this is, th that's what we've just read. We've read the meat, I think, of what Tolkien has to offer. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it isn't as imaginative in a sort of drag you along compelling way, you know, a quest mm -hmm. story. Um, but it is much more compelling I, for me as an adult than when I was a child. So it's a common thread that you'll find with lots of people that will say something to the effect. I think maybe someone, someone even, some people even on this podcast have said this. Um, I started reading The Silmarillion when I was young after reading Lord of the Rings and I put it down or I couldn't mm -hmm. finish it. Totally. That was me. Yep. And, and the other people we've interviewed too, they've said the same thing. And, and uh, and it's really um, it's it's hard to appreciate when you're young. Um, I really do think that this book is the meat um, of which the the tasty um, milk and bread came before, and and that he gave it. He gives us the the straight stuff in terms of his metaphysical view of the universe and and his insights into the nature of fallenness, uh, sin, yeah. um, God, and his providence. Um, and a lot of other things besides. Yeah. So there you go. That's my thought. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting thing, and I, I think um, you know I'm thinking about the way and it was published. Right? It was The Hobbit in '37, Lord of the Rings, I believe, and uh, Fellowship of the Ring came out in '54. Yeah. And then Silmarillion in '77. '77. Yep. Yep. And um, I think it was '36, '54, and '77. But yeah. No, '37. Is it thirty-seven? Uh, okay. Absolutely, hundred percent. Because I won the uh, trivia contest on that date. So. <laughs> well, this is my fate right. is to be wrong today. So uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sure you're right. Uh, <laughs> I'm, so I'm here, here, it's now, kind of like I, so, right? We and we talked about this a little bit, and um, a lot of other scholars say this too. You, Tolkien wrote, um, and he he expresses too, wrote to discover the story that he was writing, not to plan out the plots and the twists and figure out. Um, 
why characters had certain motivations and he was discovering it as he was writing. And so in the same way, um, Middle Earth was be kind of like an ar archaeological dig, right? It, you, you start revealing something and the, say, say you're, you're revealing a city and the first thing you see are these, the roofs, right? And it's very little, very little information, but you can start gleaning like, okay, clearly they didn't have skyscrapers or large stories. And so you can kind of get an idea of it. And that's the Hobbit. And then you start uncovering the walls and you can start seeing the formation of the city and you start seeing like it's 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 being revealed from the from the from the ground that had covered it uh and then eventually you can get into the buildings and you can see how they lived and what they did and what they ate and how they died right you get all that finally from revealing everything that's the silmarillion and so um hmm. like it's it's almost like an archaeological dig and you can't appreciate the history of it until you've seen um the the outline of it first in a way because coming in and reading about um the music of the Ainur and not um having read like having read this the Lord of the Rings first and knowing a little bit about the stars and um you know uh and the Maiar and things like that you know a little bit about it but you you, you kind of you're, you're falling into it without a whole lot of knowledge but once you get into it a little bit more and you start revealing more of the cosmology that he created it becomes far more far more interesting and far more in depth. I still think of my friend who read the Silmarillion first. Hmm. And it's, um, I think it's a Tolkien version is you can still go to, to that on our site. If you just look up, just look up and Google a Tolkien version, I'm sure you'll find it. But he read all of the stuff chronologically from beginning to end. He hadn't read it yet. And we did a whole series of this for three years back in the early 2000s, uh, where he reviewed every single chapter of the Silmarillion, pretty much everything in the Hobbit and pretty much everything in Lord of the Rings. And, uh, It'd be so much fun to listen to his thoughts on the Silmarillion. I, I have never. That'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. Do you and still have those? I still have those. Um, and um, I think it's just the one com slash virgin will take you there. Let me check. Uh, but yeah, so it's a great. It's a great sub page. <laughs> I'd be afraid to click on it. Yeah, that'll work. <laughs> Tolkien com slash virgin. <clears throat> Uh, okay, I'm gonna skip that. So I don't. Know, so so do yeah. Mean, so do, do you mean the One Ring dot com or Tolkien dot? Oh, sorry, the One Ring dot com. Did I say Tolkien? The One Ring dot yes. com. Yes, the One Ring. Okay. Oopsie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the One Ring dot com slash Virgin, and that'll take you there. You can see every single article from beginning to end. Nice. Um, I don't know how many it is. Uh, yeah, there's yeah yeah. Or does he do the Hobbit? I don't even remember. In any case, like, can you imagine reading it from from the from the Lord of Things first? Yeah, he does the Hobbit, but he does the Hobbit in multiple chapters at a time. Uh, but yeah, you can go through it. Each article is like in depth and he gives his thoughts and it's, it is truly interesting Impressive. to see what it is. Um, what's he do these days? Uh, he, he's lived in Japan for 21 years or something like that. Wow. Is he of Japanese descent? Nope. <laughs> he just wanted to go. So he did. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So, um, that is, that, that, that would be crazy, but I'm glad, I mean, you know, there's no, there's no wrong way to read it. Um, Although reading The Hobbit after, re if you're reading The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion, then you get to The Hobbit, you're like, what? <laughs> this is not what I'm used to. Regression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what? why do you think, do you think people's ideas about The Silmarillion, Silmarillion changed because of time? Because more people with scholarly intentions read it? Because back then it was still, right, it was the... Um, it was the college hippies that it was still known for, primarily mm -hmm. still, in the, even in the mid. -70s. Yeah, one of the reviewers even blames the, those hippies for the for the fact that it reached uh, you know a million in sales. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Is it that, or is it, or, or is it the appreciation that people got for the Lord of the Rings from Peter Jackson's films in the end? What what, what changed? Well, I I I think that it's the answer is fairly clear, which is that when critics give you what their opinion is, it's a it's the flash in the pan, emotion of the moment. But when a thing is worth reading, and, and then it, it, the goodness will out, that over time, the great works will be reread and people will learn to appreciate them and you'll start to see people appreciating them. Um, and if it's not a great work, like I'm pretty sure that nothing from Dan Brown will uh, will be will be cared <laughs> he's about. Our, he's 20, our whipping boy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> will be twenty years from now. Nobody will Dan care Brown. a single. No one will be re-reviewing the Da Vinci Code. You know, I bet years, the, 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 they would probably still watch the film over reading the books. The yeah, da Vinci but Code. But but that's just it, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. pe there have been films have been out for the Lord of the Rings for over twenty years, and people are still reading the Silmarillion. So yeah. there's there's an appeal to it that that. Um, has stood the test of time and then and so now you see people appreciate it for what it was yeah 
Dan, since this was your first time through the Silmarillion, do you think you would have ever finished it without doing something like what we did? And be no, honest, yeah, <laughs> no, just because I know myself. Um, Dan was I, I forced don't... to finish. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when you suggested that we do this. I remember thinking at the time, going, "Oh no, I, I don't want to do that." <laughs> really? You said, "Yeah, that's yeah. a great idea." Well, I mean, I probably said like... that, but on the inside, <laughs> I was like, "Oh man." <laughs> no, <laughs> on the inside, know. he was the crying. Testament, yeah, because I, I, you know, he probably I'm we were, a... we were. It was my last day in LA. He didn't want to make me feel bad. <laughs> Like a flying back you know, I was name. wondering, like the first time we had the podcast, you were like, there was these long moments where you would just sit there blinking three times in rapid succession. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, oh this man, is, this is something. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let me ask then: I'm being held Is hostage. there so? So this is a problem. So many people have reading the Silmarillion is is getting through it and and enjoying it and getting something out of it. What if you're doing this singularly by yourself? What is the best way to approach it? I mean, I think, let me suggest that reading it while we're reading is not a bad idea. Finding a podcast like ours that's reading through it and you yeah. can kind of like follow up and, and get insight and hear right. a discussion about it. And the best part is you can yell at the podcast while you're that's listening right. to it like, that's not what he said. <laughs> um, or you can become a member at thewonder.com slash member and join the Discord <laughs> chat and have people there to, to bounce your ideas off. I think that, I think that, <laughs> that pop-up is like the space bar on Jonathan's <laughs> right just hold the top of the app. Um, yeah, so, I, so I, I actually think the best advice is to do what we did and read it with someone. That's my best. Advice. Like, find somebody who loves Tolkien yeah. and is willing to read it and read it with them. Um, you, know, yeah. you know, I don't mean at the same time specifically, but at the same time in a general way. Like, yeah. you know, so you can yeah. talk about it as you go as you as you're reading through it together. Yeah, it's 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 hard because I feel like in order to get through something like the Silmarillion, it's kind of like for Americans in the 21st century reading the Old Testament. Hmm. It, it, just seem, it just seems like it's a culture removed. It's, it's removed in time. You have to have the hooks of this is important because of this later on. And you don't know the later on until you get to the later on. So <laughs> yeah. that, that's what's so hard about it is... is yeah. We you know, get to the genealogy and, and you know so we need so we, we, we need an F and Elf guide. <laughs> <laughs> we need a guide to the F and Elves. Yeah. That's like, well that's what we should do is write a short book called The Guide to the F and Elves. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, some, it's, it's, it's just gotta be something so that when you're reading about all these elves that all start with F, when you get to, when you get to that chapter, it's like getting to like chronicles in the in the old testament. You're just yeah. like yeah, Fingon, Fingolf, and Finway, Finarf. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Yes, and you have to understand why. Why is he going here? Well, what what's important about these names? Yeah, that. And so yeah. yeah, that that's the hard yeah. part. Yeah. And and why don't you guys appreciate others other consonants? Come on, elves, think of some. <laughs> there are other consonants in your alphabet. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, any other thoughts as we close out the Silmar Silmarillion? Before well, I was, I, I, I I was have... hoping to close with a few quotes. And okay. To, and well, maybe let, we can, how about we can this before about we close into your quotes? Um, to show the power. What would you recommend if you finished the Silmarillion and you, and you got a lot out of it and you've enjoyed it and you still want to read more Tolkien that has Silmarillion-ish references or, or feels still like Middle Earth? What would you recommend as the next book to read? I know, Dan, you don't necessarily have one. Uh, well, you've read a couple of the, the others, but um, I mean, for me, I would say it's 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 one of two things, and that is, if you want a story, read the Children of Hurin. If you want to feel like you're reading more of a novel, read that. But if you want to get more into the histories of things, read Unfinished Tales. Mm -hmm. um, and um, oh, so much of the histories of Middle Earth is like, uh, you know, entire books are are spent on the different versions of Baron and Luthien. Uh, and even the Baron Luthien book has that, where half of it is the couple, you know, the versions of it, and one of it is the prose, or half of it is the prose. Um, so I, that, that's where my recommendation is. The Peoples of Middle Earth, I think it's number 10, also has a lot of interesting shorter uh, stories and, and, and information that, that, that that's well done. And if you're going to get the histories of Middle Earth, just look on eBay. There's so many copies of it from people who bought it who were like, this isn't Tolkien. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not a bad idea to go there and find it. I finally fin uh, completed my my version. It's on this side here. My uh, all my all my 
12 ver copies of nice. it. Nice. Uh, they still can't get them all digitally, which kind of sucks. But yeah, I, I just went on eBay and was like, all right, I got to buy the last three that are kind of out of print and aren't super expensive. But um, nice. yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's, well, that's, a good, that's a good. So you're saying if the Silmarillion is, is, is something you find too easy. Like go find something harder <laughs> of, of Tolkien's to write. Well, now that you've been disappointed that the Silmarillion isn't like the Lord of the Rings, you can be even more disappointed by reading Unfinished Tales and realize yes. these tales aren't finished, even Jonathan, though that's the name Jonathan of the freaking has, book. Jonathan has just given you <laughs> something that will make you even more disappointed in Tolkien. Oh my gosh. It's great. Yeah. Actually, the Children of Hurin, is, it is disappointing that, that that was never finished. That was... I know. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been good to see. Like, well, it ties together, right? You, you know, he, he at least defeats Glaurung so that in the following tales, he's already gone, right? The, the, it's the big baddie who is going to change the tide of the future battles. And now that he's not there, the, uh, what is it? What is the, is it the near Nathan Nordia that comes after that? Or is it, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that, you know, Glaurung isn't there. He would have, he would have defeated them even more greatly. Than... He would have stomped them even more than they were stomped already. <laughs> right, right. Uh, all right. So are those are those the two uh, um, series, I guess, that came after Tolkien died? Was you have the histories of Middle Earth and the unfinished tales? Are those like the two big books? Uh, histories of Middle Earth is now twelve volumes, and it's wow. tons of notes. I mean, it's it is it's this whole part right here. If you look at my bookshelf, it's yeah, it goes. It takes up half that bookshelf at the top, right? over there and it's, but, it's a lot of co a collection of his notes like notes stuff that wasn't like really finished. different versions like if you go yeah, through the early versions of yeah like choice. there's two co two versions the first two are the book of lost tales part one and two and it's how tolkien started his whole uh legendarium of understanding like where the elves were from and stuff like that and so the, the book of lost tales is about uh a, 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 a sailor who comes up on this island and there's something called the cottage of lost play and then there are the elves there and they started there there's guys telling them stories and you can see that this was the seed of everything that came out of it and all the spellings of people are different and and mm -hmm. every, all the languages are different it's it just very very different and so if you're really into the it's like you know now that you've got it's like an you've heard of the word tell for an archaeological dig right where cities are built on top of cities on top of cities like this is like going past the the final thing that was built the 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 greatest i mean sometimes it's not the greatest but the the city on top and then you get further and there's even more depth but it's less like the one on top until you get to the very bottom city where you're like oh well this was nothing like what uh the the original one and that's kind of like what it feels like when you go through some of the histories of middle earth on the other hand there are some great gemstones and tidbits within yeah. them like the like when if you all remember when i when we were reading about the when morgoth finally defeats everybody and he's basically king of the world and his the speech to hurin and hurin's response to him that's only in the unfinished tales like we have a very brief version of that in the Silmarillion, but but yeah. there's the the better version the cooler version of his full response and and basically hurin's like he's a defeated man bound literally bound in chains on a chair being threatened by the most powerful being on middle earth and he's basically slapping him in the face verbally um which is awesome and but that whole that the the greater speech is only found in the unfinished tales and so yeah, yeah there are those tidbits which are awesome but yeah you get to sift through a lot of old um pr uh, uh, pre-work in order to get there my goal is in the next couple of years to read every every single one cover to cover because i've read parts wow. a lot of them i've read the first or two and a half now um but i'm reading some other tolkien books i still have to read the nature of middle earth never got to finish that. well that's book. what i was going to say is when you get to the nature of middle earth now you're talking about like something that is it's like a dictionary it's not even a history book <laughs> it, it has the encyclopedia it just has a, yeah it's like the wikipedia the valid wikipedia i have it over there but um it's just you know like each 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 entry is like and here's what here's about dwarves and their life and and you read about all, all there is to know about dwarves and yeah. um yeah. you know or what elves take on time is um hmm. And and so it's it's it's, it's interesting. Kind of cool. It's very cool, but it's, but it's more like a reference book. And in some ways, it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, Austin Freeman's um, metaphysics, Tolkien dogmatics. Yeah, the dogmatics of uh, a Tolkien dogmatics, which is uh, he, you know, it's like a reference book because he yeah. he researched that the hell out of that so well that. Um, yeah. Or the heaven out of that. I'm just correcting. <laughs> yeah, he didn't this get to the hell. Family enough. podcast. Come oh, on. Right. Right. <laughs> is it? 
Uh, I guess it is. I don't know. It's, I mark it as clean on Apple Podcasts so that we know. Mm. But I, I, wait, I think you're does, okay. Does the word hell make <laughs> put put it into the yeah. dirty category? I don't know. Probably There's probably autocorrect on your iPhone for that word. So hmm. uh, anyway, all right. So, Michael, why don't we jump into your... Your, the final, the, the quotes you wanted to bring out, the things that you wanted to pull out here as we close up the Silmarillion, guys. 39, thir, 39 episodes of nice. the Silmarillion. Nice. So. Well, I wanted to finish just by sort of revisiting some of the greater, I mean, and in the Silmar uh, speeches that Tolkien has his characters given, these are just, each of them is just a single paragraph um, or less than a paragraph, sometimes a couple sentences. I was reminded of this, the greatness of this by Jonathan, though, because Jonathan's, Jonathan famously, right. in, in some of our earlier episodes, says it over and over again, how wonderful the prose of Tolkien is, that we forget the quality of his prose um, sometimes because of the imaginative nature of his work. But the quality of his prose is fantastic. So I picked a handful of lines from um, and, and small speeches given uh, from, from uh, this, the whole... Um, a Silmarillion that were some of my favorites, but um, you know we can we can. Uh, I, I already each have our own. some of mine in those quotes from earlier. Yeah, know, and and one of those is very close to one of mine. So the first, my first great quote and speech is from or or you know prose description is from Fionor, and it is so this is not to be admired, but it is it does have that sort of rebel ring to it, which. Tolkien, um, I think, kind of captures. And this is when Theonor has, has has convinced the Noldor, or many of the Noldor, to take the vow and and never uh, rest until they have the Simrils back, which have been stolen from Morgoth. And uh, they're about to leave and, and head to the the, um, the the ships to try to mm -hmm. sail across to Middle-earth. So the kinslain hasn't happened yet, but the Herald of Manwe comes and warns them off mm -hmm. and says, hey, um, this is not a good idea. You you, you, need to, you need to not do this. And here is Fianor's response. Then turning to the herald, he cried, Say this to Manwe Sulimo, High King of Arda. If Fianor cannot overthrow Morgoth, at least he delays not to assail him and sits not idle in grief. And it may be that Eero has set in me a fire greater than thou knowest. Such hurt at the least will I do to the foe of the Valar that even the mighty in the ring of doom shall wonder to hear it. Yea, in the end, they shall follow me. Hmm. Farewell. Yeah, I love that. It's great. It's fantastic. That's... Short and brief, it, succinct, gets to the point, and he's right. Okay, he's right that the Valar are just sitting idle in grief. In fact, they are about to sit idle a lot longer, years, in fact. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the end, yea, in the end, they shall follow me. And in the end, the mighty do follow him because Arendil comes back and he convinces them, but they follow him to Middle Earth, and they finally complete the task, which is the defeat of Morgoth. And so I, I, I love his. You know, Feanor is a, about the most flawed character among the elves that you can get, yet he has this yeah. this line. So there's there's line number one. Any did you did you guys remember that, or is it is it is it one of yours? I, oh yeah, because that brought up the whole discussion about at least they're doing something like those yep. silly Valar just sitting on their butts, looking at the trees all day long. Oh, yeah. It's so pretty and shiny. <laughs> or, well, it used to be or, or it used to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, oh what do we do? Yeah, so dark exactly. now. <laughs> Stupid Valar. Stupid no, no, Valar. no. They came up. All right, probably, probably All right, not. Next Stupid. one. Next Stupid. one. All right, next one is from his his uh, half brother. So my favorite elf, Fingolfin. Mm. And so we go. And this is his description. This is not a speech. This is the description of his challenge to Morgoth and Morgoth's response. And it's a great. It's just beautifully epic. It's it's um, Anglo-Saxon war prose. It's the way like the the, the challenge has been made, and Fingolfin's going to die. He's an elf challenging the greatest of the Valar. Yeah. <clears throat> Thus he came alone to Angband's gates, and he sounded his horn and smote once more upon the brazen doors and challenged Morgoth to come forth to single combat, and Morgoth came. And he issued forth, clad in black armor, and he stood before the king, the king being Fingolfin, like a tower, iron crowned in his vast shield, sable unblazoned, cast a shadow over him like a storm cloud. But Fingolfin gleamed beneath it as a star, for his mail was overlaid with silver, and his blue shield was set with crystals. And he drew his sword, Ringil, that glittered like ice. 
Man. So this is beautiful. I mean, it's showing the power of evil, like this darkness, and it comes and his doom. Bing Goldman's doom is here, and he's going to do something nobody else does, which is he wounds Morgoth seven times before he dies. But but he's doomed. But he's still, and this is the great juxtaposition to go back to what you talked about earlier in this pe- in this uh, podcast, Dan, about the star. And and to, now here we have a star under the thorn, the, the the storm cloud. So Morgoth is this vast darkness, and underneath it is the star and the blue Chris, the shield with crystals on it, and the sword glittering like ice, Ringil. And it's just this b- picture of this beauty, and you know, in, in, in defiance of the evil. Um, and he dies in defiance, but he dies in defiance, not not defying, not dying, fleeing, and not dying um, in despair. And he he's the only one that ever called Morgoth out. Mm-hmm. Nobody uh, Morgoth never came out of Angband outside of that one time. Right, right. Hmm. So anyway, that was I love Fingolfin, yeah. and uh, that was. He was your favorite, right? I think you mentioned he is, he is my favorite elf. Yeah. He is my favorite elf. Was he, he's dead now? Sorry, man. We read through that part. <laughs> <laughs> he lives still in the halls of Mendos. <laughs> point taken. Point. point taken. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so my third passage is the speech of Baron to Thingol <laughs> um, that he gives in his throne room when he's brought before him. Baron is in love with Luthien, has declared his love for her and she to him, and. Has now been has now come to her court of her father, who he knows will not respond well, and um, in fact, Thingol says, um, "What would you hear, unhappy mortal? And for what cause have you left your own land to enter this which is forbidden to such as you? Can you show reason why my power should not be laid on you in heavy punishment for your insolence and folly?" So this is Baron's response. So this is, and I love this because this is a classic. This is Tolkien doing the Arthurian um, response in love, de- declaration of love, mm-hmm. but in a very Arthurian way. In other words, he's responding as a king to a king. Um, he's not really a king, Baron isn't, but he's he's a lord of his of his the remnants of his people. So yeah. then Baron, looking up, beheld the eyes of Luthien. And his glance went also, also to the face of Melian, and it seemed to him that words were put in his mouth. I'm going to pause there and just say, here's the callback to the inspiration. This is what actual femininity and power brings, is this, this power to inspire the hearts of men, mm. in this case with love, both from his love, Luthien, and from her mother. Yeah. Fear left him, and the pride of the eldest house of men returned to him, and he said, my fate, O king, led me hither, through perils such as few even of the elves would dare. And here I have found what I sought, not indeed, but finding I would possess forever. For it is above all gold and silver, and beyond all jewels, neither rock nor steel, nor the fires of Morgoth, nor all the powers of the elf kingdoms, shall keep me from the treasure that I desire. For Luthien, your daughter, is the fairest of all the children of the world." You know, that's funny. Um, that's exactly what I said to my current father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> no, did you really? No, 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 no of course not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, that would be about the nerdiest thing possible. That would be. I don't know if uh, I'd be married to her right now, though, if I did say that. <laughs> that's right. And, and it's so cool because he says, he just doesn't say, she's the fairest to me. She's the loveliest to me. Yeah, no, he says the fairest of all the, not even not even the mirror mirror on the wall, not the fairest who happens to be living right now. Yeah, she's just yeah. the fairest of all the children of the world. That's all. <laughs> and and I will not stop until um, she, I, I have this treasure that I desire. This is mm-hmm. this is um, beautiful. It's like, it's... it's. Um, There's yeah. so much of that, I think, in Baron and Luthien, maybe that trumps all the other stories with, with, with phrases that are memorable, I think. Yeah. Um, and moments. Yeah. Is that yeah, all of them? Uh, one more. One more. Um, and then we, we did read this online. Uh, it's actually kind of, uh, of um, two others in a, set, in, a, in, okay. a, um, in a similar vein. Um, but these are, and maybe I shouldn't have, uh, I should have done them in this order, but these are, uh, <laughs> these are descriptions of evil. And this is the evil of Sauron and the evil that he wrought, that he, that he has wrought. Mm-hmm. namely in the, in the Nazgul. So when we're first introduced to Sauron, or not first introduced to him, but when he's first 
um, sort of made in this in the tale of Baron and Luthien. He's he's his evil is is described. Here's the description Tolkien uses: Sauron was now become a sorcerer of dreadful power, master of shadows and of phantoms, foul in wisdom, cruel in strength, misshaping what he touched, twisting what he ruled, lord of werewolves. His dominion was torment. That's so fun. His dominion was torment. Usually yes. his dominion was the, was the uh, desert on the other side of the mountains, right? No, no, no. His dominion <laughs> was, was torment. torment. I mean, that's just beautiful prose. Yes. That's Tolkien. It's almost Shakespearean the way Tolkien uses it there. And, and I find a similar vein in his description of the Nazgul, which we, which we read, but I'll read again. We read a couple episodes ago, but I'll read again. Mm -hmm. Men proved easier to ensnare. Mm -hmm. Those who used the nine rings became mighty in their day. Kings sorcerers and warriors of old they obtained glory and great wealth yet it turned to their undoing they had it seemed unending life yet life became unendurable to them they could walk if they would unseen by all eyes in this world beneath the sun and they could see things in worlds invisible to mortal men but too often they beheld only the phantoms and delusions of sauron and one by one, sooner or later, according to their native strength and to the good or evil of their wills in the beginning, they fell under the thraldom of the ring that they bore and under the dominion of the one, which was Sauron's. And they became forever invisible, save to him that wore the ruling ring, and they entered into the realm of shadows. The Nazgul they were, the ring wraiths, the enemy's most terrible servants. Darkness went with them, and they cried with the voices of death. Just beautiful yeah, yeah. I, like it still has power even though i've we've read about the nazgul eighteen thousand times is yeah. it like his his description of the the fall and corruption of people he can even make the description compelling it's like yeah. almost horror literature reminds me a little like the barrow whites were like that it, it felt mm -hmm. like horror in the, the lord of the rings and he brings that out tolkien can write horror that, that's for sure so anyway, those were the passages that uh, that were some of the ones that stood out, and just showing Tolkien, showing himself a master of prose and and um, and conveying the conveying of the beautiful and the terrible in his yeah. ideas. And I, I like that closing on the best prose in the Silmarillion. It's, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing because that's what that's what makes me fall in love with Tolkien is the way he writes more than anything else. Yeah, yeah, I, I love the Silmarillion. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to go through, Jonathan. Well, it wasn't me. It was all of us together. It's just, yeah. And thank you, Dan, for saying yes, even though you meant no. <laughs> <laughs> it all worked out. Sometimes yes means end. no. I mean, no means yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are. We're still gonna. Obviously, we're not done. We're not. This was like two years in the making since that fateful day at Knott's Berry Farm, where Dan texted me and said, "Hey, did you see what this other website tweeted about Tolkien and uh, <laughs> that? That was and uh, that started me down this path of like, okay, I need to continue this whole conversation because we started like again. We started on the Babylon Bees." Lord of the Rings podcast, all of us right. did. And uh, now we're, we're sort of simply continuing that journey. Uh, and we're going to continue it with On Fairy Stories, which I don't think, uh, I don't think you have that yet, Danny, right? You haven't read it yet? You haven't seen it? Read I it? think I was given a copy of that, but I have not cracked it okay. open. All right. So in this week's edition of If You Like Tolkien. So if you like Tolkien, what you should be getting into is actually the book. And so there are two places that you can get this book, two places, two, two places I, I guess I would recommend to uh, get the book. And uh, one is going to be uh, Amazon, right? You can get Tales from the Perilous Realm that has on fairy stories in it. Um, you can get a different versions of it. The paperback is twelve sixty nine. Michael, you have the, I don't have this copy actually. I don't. I never. I never got this. So I'm going to have to probably grab a copy myself. Uh, it has on fairy stories, which is um, a treatise on fairy stories by Tolkien. What it means, um, what to take out of it, what he thought about it. Um, but also, what else does it have in there? Uh, you, do you have your copy in front of you? I do. So it has um, of Tolkien's mostly most of his non non uh, Middle Earth. Uh, fictional works. So he ha it has Rover Random, it has Far Farmer Giles of Ham, it has The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which is, of course, Middle Earth, mm. but in a weird poetic way. Uh, it has The Smith of Wooten Major and Leaf by Niggle. Interesting. So it's mostly, it's still fiction, mostly, yep. other than yep. on fairy stories. Okay. Yep. So that's one, that's one thing. You can get this here. Um, I, I didn't do any research into a whole lot of other stories. So you can get it from here uh, on Amazon. 
or, or wherever else, right? You can, uh, who's it? Hot Mifflin publishes it probably. Yep. Uh, so you can probably find it in any other bookstore uh, online. You can also find it on eBay if you want a used version, a hardback version, uh, slightly different version. Wow, 767, that's a pretty good deal right there with free shipping, look at that. Um, the other one you can get is actually a copy that I had, which is called uh, The Monsters and the Critics. And uh, this one is out of print, but the interesting thing about this one is this is all nonfiction. So this one has um, uh, a bunch of essays by him. One is Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics. One is On Translating Beowulf. They has, he has uh, his treatise on Sir Gawain and the Green Knight on yeah. fairy stories. English and Welsh, I don't even remember what that one's about. One called A Secret Vice, which I believe is about his secret vice of uh, philology languages. And then the last one is a valedictory address he gave. So it's all nonfiction. It's all his thoughts, which is kind of cool. So that if you already have like, um, like this one, the Tolkien reader, which has a lot of those things that Michael already mentioned. Uh, if you can get a copy of this here, right? There's, it's 1356 is the cheapest one I found, 1669, some more expensive ones. Um, but it's similar to the price if you can get it off eBay, uh, because on Amazon, it's like $50 for the used version. So Ooh. yeah. Definitely not um, my cup of tea when buying that. But I, I really like this book because it's all nonfiction stuff if you're into that uh, as a highlight of reading his stuff right now. Oh, also get get his letters, right? That's a really good way of getting insight into Tolkien. As we're That's, yeah, some of the best. Some of the best stuff yeah. is in his letters. Yeah. All right. So, guys, we're done. That's it. Oh, wait, we're not done because we're going into our extended member podcast, which you guys know it. It's a broken record. Thewondering.com slash member. Join us there. Ask questions in Discord. We're going to be asking questions. We're going to be going into a little bit more on fairy stories about what to expect. Uh, talking about what we're going to do after on fairy stories because that'll probably take about a month in addition to a couple episodes. So we'll probably in six to eight weeks, we'll, we'll be on to our next uh, major Adventure. endeavor into the podcast. <clears throat> and then we'll also talk about um, the stone of Eric. Eric, my cousin, Eric, his stone. <laughs> That's, that's what we're going <laughs> I think it's Arak, but okay. <laughs> uh, in the Germanic way. Um, and then we'll talk about all the different uh, types of life in Middle Earth. Men, elves, dwarves, Balrogs, dragons. What are they all? Like Huan, what is it? Like We're going to get into some of that because after reading the Silmarillion, there's like Karadras. What is that? Um, we'll get into some of that that's too. fun. So join us there, thewondering.com slash member, four bucks a month, first month is free if you just despise paying the extra four dollars. Hey man, used to say that it's four dollars a month for, you know, it's the price of a coffee. Oh no, it's the price of 80% of a coffee now because coffees are way too expensive. It's like five bucks now. Uh, all right, guys, we're done. So Michael, Woo, yeah. in our final sign off, what is it Goodbye, you got to say? Goodbye, freeloaders.